Hi, this is Robert Shearer with another edition of Shear Intelligence, where the intelligence comes from my guests. In this case, they're in London and certainly a center of intelligence about many things, but about uh, imperialism in the world, kind of been a world leader and uh, some of the dire consequences. And that's what we are to talk about, a, a fascinating documentary, and I'm not using it lightly, uh, and it's called a phantom parrot, and this was something that was revealed, a program of GCHQ, I believe, with the intelligence agency in England. But thanks to Edward Snowden, uh, we learned that this agency has uh, had vast powers to spy, along with the NSA. They obviously cooperate. They're pro both part of Five Eyes spying on us. And the principal character who's also with us. So that's Kate Stonehill is the director. And Mohammed Rabani, uh, do I pronounce that correctly? Rabani uh, is the principal character because yeah, he yeah. is actually the well-intentioned uh, human being who's trying to help people who are in trouble. He's the managing uh, director of a group called CAGE, uh, which is concerned about helping people who have been the victims of uh, government overreach, as it's put, but really we're talking about torture and everything else. And and so we learned from Edward Snowden, who is unfortunately not available uh, except, you know, in, in exile forced by the United States, but that in fact, uh, in terms of the use of technology, uh, the U.S. and England uh, have set a, a, an international example of intrusion and surveillance and what have you. And so that's what this movie, Phantom Parrot, uh, reveals. It's a movie that's been on a circuit of you know, film shows uh, and so forth, festivals. Uh, we're going to have a trailer of it posted on our site and a website you can go to to learn more about it. But we have this time now. And so why don't I begin with you, Kate? Why did you make this movie? What's it about? And so forth. And then we'll go to your star subject. Sure. Um, so, yes, yeah, so Phantom Parrot is a feature length documentary that follows uh, Rabani as he is um, prosecuted under a UK terror law for refusing to hand over the passwords to his electronic devices. Um, and so in the process, it unravels a secret UK government program called Phantom Parrot, where thousands of people are stopped at the border ask for their passwords, and then have their data extracted um, and loaded into a database. Um, and so I um, I came, I, I met Rabani through um, a short film I, I'd made previously, and that film uh, featured six people who were labelled as non-violent extremists by the UK government. Um, and I was doing some work for Channel 4 News, and I kept in touch with one of those individuals and he had a court case against the UK government. Um, and I said to him, you know, what's happening with your court case? And he said, not much really, but I think you should really meet Rabani. So we met um, and all I knew at the time was that he was, um, you know, facing prison for his decision to not give his passwords. Um, and I just thought it would be a, um, a, a, I thought that, you know, that was a, an extremely shocking situation. And I thought that it would be an opportunity to ask questions about our data and who who has the right to coerce us into giving it to them. Right. And in the compelling opening scenes, uh, he gets off a plane. Uh, I believe you have your child with you uh, at that point. And yeah. uh, the next thing you know, and they, they're all very polite in England, and they tell you just sit there. And this, but they say, you know, uh, I can't do a British accent, uh, uh, but it reeks of authority. And uh, you know, uh, we, we're going to ask you these questions, and then the punchline comes. And if you don't give us the password to your gadgets, which we've seized from you, your phone and so forth, uh, you're going to be subject to arrest under this draconian legislation. And and, uh, and they just present it as the most normal occurrence in the world. Now, of course, we complain about human rights violations. We in the United States, anyway, our government, human rights violations all over the place, anywhere in the world. And, uh, you know, in fact, we have Julian Assange in prison there for revealing some of our own uh, crimes, right, to clear crimes, killing civilians and so forth in Iraq and elsewhere. Uh, so I want to get to that, this conceit 
of, of the West, that somehow we're on the side of, of virtue. We're seeing that now in the Mideast. There's an excellent documentary, The Gatekeepers, mm -hmm. about what uh, the secret uh, um, domestic agency uh, Shin Bet has been doing in the West Bank for years by former directors of it. Nonetheless, the U.S. Congress, or at least the House of Representatives now said, you can't ask any questions about that because they're, you know, part of the, the zone of free societies and so forth. So uh, let me ask you, uh, Rabani, uh, Muhammad Rabani, uh, how did you get into this and what is your organization? And then I do want to make clear, it, one of the most compelling things about this, we actually hear from a person who was tortured, who you worked uh, on his human rights thing. So why don't you introduce uh, actually the lead character? Sure. Thank you so much. Um, you, you've noticed that Kate calls me Rabani, and although that's my second name, that that is actually what I'm known by. But you can feel free to call me Muhammad. That's totally fine. Uh, but a lot of people call me Rabani. So just so so listeners are not confused as well. Um, so as you've said in your introduction, um, the film focuses on the aspects of privacy, government surveillance. And also uh, the story of one individual called Ali al Marri. He's a torture survivor. He was held in the US for around 12 or 13 years, um, during which some of, the, um, some of the techniques of sleep deprivation, torture, and abuse that are used in Guantanamo Bay prison were used on him, even though he was a prisoner on US soil. So the story, my connection to the story is essentially. He's one of our clients in my organization. Our organization is a 20-year-old organization. It specializes in supporting those people who've been victims of torture and abuse at the hands of primarily um, the US government and its allies. Um, so in the course of our work, we, we came across his case and um, we were asked to, to investigate um, an allegation that he was bringing in, in the case. And, and that allegation was, that um, he had documentary evidence of at least three names, maybe more, at least three names, named individuals who were involved in his torture. So we obviously were very keen and interested to support him so that there can be accountability for the torture that he faced at the hands of American uh, government representatives or agents. So I went on a trip to Doha in, in Qatar and uh, with lawyers of uh, Ali al Marri, this individual that I'm referring to. And on my way back, when I uh, landed back in the UK, um, what transpired was my I, I was stopped at the, at the desk, asked a few basic questions, and then I was asked to go in for an interview, or it's an interrogation rather. Um, and um, that then ultimately led to the police officers demanding that I give access to my laptop and my phone um, because they were determined in getting hold of the data that I may be in possession of, maybe the, the files connected to the Ali al Madri case. Um, whatever their intentions were, they just were determined to get hold of the, my devices. I of course, um, refused because I felt that it would be a absolute breach of trust and confidentiality, um, my duty of care to a torture survivor. The police, I thought, would be reasonable. At the, at the beginning, I, I thought they would understand that, you know, I cannot um, in any way um, surrender this information without getting the consent well, of the victim himself. Let me just interrupt. Himself. The victim at they that went, point was no longer being held, right? Yeah, correct. He had by this time. By this time, it was around maybe three months or six months into his release. He had already served his time. And his attorney, and the documentary who was goes very into how he had... in the film, uh, was uh, was he, was Andy what Savage. Is his name? Yeah, and uh, Andy Savage. He was instrumental in getting him released, or I couldn't quite tell. Well, absolutely. I mean, he played a huge role. Um, ultimately, the justice system, the way it works for political cases like this, they offer some sort of plea deal. And unless you accept the plea deal, you end up with a 120-year sentence or something like that. 
So what Ali al Mari did was he accepted a uh, admission of guilt, even though he was innocent of that crime. And his lawyer um, tried his best to to sort of get his client off without any admission. In the end, as it as it turns out, um, he he was able to at least come out of prison and then clear his name and clarify that you know whatever he admitted to was because he was coerced. He had no other choice. Well, I want to be clear um, about this. So, so the government never yeah. really, first of all, never brought him to trial. And uh, after 12, 13 years in which he had been tortured. Uh, fairly consistently, uh, what did they come up with? What is the guilt or the alleged guilt? Well, firstly, two or three years of his imprisonment, he was disappeared, which means the government did not acknowledge that they were holding him. It also means that he had no access to lawyers and he had no phone calls. His family didn't know if he was alive or dead. Uh, he was disappeared. And in that period of American history, the U.S. was running a program called the Secret Detention Black Sites Program, right? So the CIA were running that program. And what they would do is go around the world and just pick off people for interrogation. And they just disappear them. They take them to black sites in various countries. Um, I think around 56 countries participated in that program with the CIA. And they would, under torture, be um, pressured to give up the names of other individuals. And then those people would be rounded up and the whole process would continue. So Ali al Madri found himself in this type of situation in the beginning. So two, three years, he was just disappeared. Um, after which he was brought to, um, there was acknowledgement, he was presented in front of some sort of military uh, type court system. And uh, he then stayed in prison for around another five or six years without trial. And then he was brought, brought, brought to trial. And um, as I mentioned, that, that's how the judges decided that, you know, you've already served like seven or eight years. We're going to sentence you in the total, total of, I think, 18 years or something like that. So he then served his time. And we met him after he was released. And I think that was 2015. And, and the, you like met that. him at a time when he was, what, now trying to sue uh, for admission or clear his name? Exactly. He was very keen to make sure that, number one, he's, um, um, the false allegations against him are cleared and he is acknowledged as an innocent person who was wrongly arrested unjustly imprisoned, deprived of his due process rights. He was very keen to do that. And, and also, more importantly, because he was subjected to torture, uh, he believed that he had sufficient evidence to actually um, pursue these perpetrators in a court of law. And that's where Cage gets involved in the story, actually. So we, we were asked to look at this matter. So we organized uh, UK lawyers, and he had some American lawyers. And uh, we began investigating the case, um, as I mentioned. And, and it was on that, I suppose, um, consequential or fateful trip that um, as I gathered his testimony and I, as I had collected all of the data and material that he shared with us, um, I made that return journey back to the UK. And the You know, UK your, your matter-of-fact tone belies the legal atrocity here, which is here is somebody who disappeared, well, disappeared, was kidnapped. Uh, it's an official state act. Uh, <laughs> no one knows where he is, but he's tortured. That uh, we don't call because we call it enhanced interrogation. And these supposedly civilized Western leaders in England and the United States and elsewhere think they have the right to do that. No one, I gather, in connection with this case, has ever been brought to trial for torturing. The torture is, uh, I think, the, to this day, only John Kiriakou, the former CIA agent who actually did not participate in torture but was involved in capturing people, was supposed to be connected with al Qaeda. He served two years for revealing that fact. But I, I think this case yeah. is yes. another example where the people actually doing the torture, there was no accountability for torture or call it enhanced interrogation. Mm -hmm. So when he tries to get some acknowledgement, some accountability, you're involved in that process. You're interviewing him. You're getting information. You end up uh, having the full weight 
of the law, at least in England, against you for the crime of trying to help a former prisoner who claims he was innocent and maltreated. Is that correct? And what would they say if That's they were listening to right. this? Thing? Oh, no, no. It's not like that at all, right? Absolutely. They would. They even denied the police. Once I ended up in court, uh, the police were also summoned. And they just straight up denied that they had any knowledge of me, the individual, let alone the fact that I was uh, involved in this case. Um, they just denied it. And, and in the end, the judge pressured them. And they had to admit, uh, I think halfway through the day, they had to admit that, yes, they had prior knowledge. It was an intelligence-led stop. Um, they knew who I was. They knew, and they were prepared, and they deliberately stopped me in order to ultimately try to get my uh, devices. Yeah, because it's interesting. I'm going to turn back just briefly to Kate Stonehill, who made this movie. You have wonderful footage of the debate and I guess it's the House of Commons about these laws. And and again, they have this wonderful accent and everybody, you know, I guess they're wearing wigs and things and they look so reasonable. And they're, they're telling you there's absolutely no dire consequence to anyone from the, uh, passing a law that says they can stop and grab all your material. The irony in this, by the way, is that the Fourth Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, which uh, prevents... Uh, warrantless searches, of which is this what this would be. Um, actually, Chief Justice Roberts of the U.S. Supreme Court has declared uh, that 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 part of the Constitution was in fact the basis for the American Revolution. It was, uh, and John Adams had even witnessed it and, and and said that, and that this was fundamental because he wanted to prevent agents of the king from barging into people's house, rummaging around, and John Roberts in the U.S. Supreme Court declared, no, and modern technology deserves the same protection, even more so, because in the words of Chief Justice Roberts, there's more information on your phone than was ever in your domicile. So here you come with a phone in England where they haven't learned the lesson of the American Revolution, nor have we, by the way. We have gutted the uh, Fourth Amendment. And you are a prime example of, I guess, what the American Revolution was formed about because they want their challenge to uh, government power used in an unreasonable way. And you're trying to help a prisoner and they think they have the right to get that information and you won't give them the passwords, right? And you then become the culprit. Is this a fair summary? Because when yeah, I just stated, somebody's going to want to know what's the other side? What's the other claim? That there was mm. well, the other the other claim. I'll I'll just share it with you. The other claim. The other side argues that unless we have these draconian, very intrusive laws and powers at the borders, terrorists are going to come into our country and blow the place up. So that's that's the argument. I e it's a national security argument. The the idea that uh, we must be able, we must be willing to give up some of these very um, precious rights and liberties in if we want to have a safe right, and secure country. Uh, I That's how they frame Every uh, uh, tyrannical government claims they have national security interests and there are foreign enemies. But what the whole point of the U.S. Constitution was that you couldn't trust any government, certainly not the English government, uh, but you couldn't trust your own because after all, these amendments were put in to restrain the new American government, right? And what it could do. And the basic yeah. argument is you can't. First of all, even as a philosophical legal mm -hmm. matter, you couldn't claim a danger if you didn't have a specific uh, reason. That's what a, a warrantless search is all about. They couldn't rummage it down in your iPhone mm -hmm. or in your domicile, but a fact is there is no evidence that anybody's come up with that any of these measures, call them enhanced interrogation or call them what they should be called torture, have produced any usable evidence. Mm. Was there any in this case? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, can I, I'll just give you a few very simple stats. At least I can speak about the UK. Um, we've actually, from CAGE, we've published a report that investigates this power. It's called Schedule 7 of the Terrorism Act. So um, on average, just giving you round figures, around 50,000 people are stopped under this power no, each year. I should just say that has um, gone nowadays, down. But yes, 
it has gone down. But it's gone down. Yeah. If you look at the, yeah. I mean, the point point being that if you look at the averages over since twenty years, it's it's around fifty thousand. Nowadays, um, it's gone down, and there's some sort of well, technical, COVID. COVID um, is part of that. Uh, tricks. Yeah. What what the police do? They they have a sort of a, a trick that they play, which is um, they still stop huge numbers of people, but they don't record the stop. Uh, I'm 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 a, I'm a living example of it. Like oh, uh, maybe uh, eight out of ten of my last trips, I've been stopped, but I'm never given a notice. I'm never given a, an acknowledgement that I've been stopped and searched and questioned. So what they've done is they've they've very cleverly. Um, massage the figures by uh, not recording most of those stops now. In any case, the point being, even if it's 2,000 uh, a year, what they argue is um, um, if you look at the numbers who are stopped compared to the numbers of people who are charged for a crime, the percentage you get is 0.03%. Um, that, that's the ratio. The, the numbers of people that are charged for a crime compared to the numbers who are stopped, interrogated, searched without any uh, right to remain silent, without any suspicion. So that is extremely revealing. It shows that the power is there, it's being used, but clearly they're not going after the criminals. They're going after innocent people who are just passing through the borders, coming back home. Um, so that, the statistics on, actually- going after intimidating people like you who are trying to bring some measure of legal protection to a, a wrongfully accused person mm -hmm. who spent 12 to 13, whatever, 13 years imprisoned. I mean, come mm -hmm. on, we're talking about a serious crime, grabbing a human being uh, uh, who you have no real evidence against, and you can keep them uh, incognito and imprisoned for, for 12, 13 years. Somebody comes along like you, and you're part of a group trying to bring some justice to it. And yes, intimidation. Don't you feel more intimidated by, I mean, you, and you were picked, it's a very effective documentary uh, because you use, uh, you use modern technology to kind of reconstruct the interrogation room and what it must feel like and so forth. So I think technologically a very clever film. I was very impressed and, uh, you know, but when I put myself in your shoes, I, I would think this is really intimidating. And maybe I won't go interview uh, an ex-prisoner somewhere or maybe I don't need this or, you know, that's what we're really talking about here is a chilling effect on the freedom of everyone. Well, I think I think that's a really important point. And one thing mm. that I often try and point out is well, it, this power has been used, first of all, in, in a targeted way against lots of activists and journalists. But secondly, it was used um, to stop uh, David Miranda, the partner of Glenn Greenwald, while he was helping his partner report or his husband report on the Snowden leaks. And so one of the reasons we even know that there's this secret program in operation is because of this document that was leaked by Edward Snowden. But this same law, Schedule 7, was actually used to try and stymie that process. So I think that, you know, you, you, you go back to that footage of the passage of the law. And for me, it was really interesting to see the concerns that were being raised and then to look at where we are now and what we've seemingly accepted as a public and say, you know, how far have we come, you know? Well, that. let me ask you a question as a filmmaker, mm -hmm. uh, because you, yeah, I saw another film you made, I, think, I don't know if it was set in the Ukraine or where it was, but it had to do with uh, other governments, uh, surveillance of people, right? Well, it was, was a, it was about fake news. I think you were talking about fake news fairy yeah. tale in oh, Macedonia. Yeah. 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 And but it was basically part of the support of the U.S. narrative that we're besieged by fake news from bad actors somewhere else. But what is the response to this film? Because I mean, it it, it just seems as if yes. Thanks to Edward Snowden and a few other people like John Kiriakou, we learned about the existence of, of this program. Uh, and so what? We got used to it. We accepted it. It in no way tarnishes our, our sense of virtue 
uh, that we're a wonderful law-abiding society, and you know, and it in no way denies our right to call out, which I think is very legitimate as a journalist or anyone else to call out any violation of civil liberties anywhere in the world. But the the prevailing um, what is it called? I don't know. It's a sort of drug or something in, in England, the United States, and place like that, uh, was loosely described as the West, is uh, you get over it. Hmm. It's like you had a bad cold. And then we found, or well, it was a flu, and we found the vaccine. Or something. It's over. We never do it again, hmm. and so forth. And yet, we only were able to document that this program was there because of here, Edward Snowden, and he can't ever come back. And if we get our hands on him, there are people who call themselves enlightened liberals who actually think he should be, they should throw away the key. And I I don't want to bring it up, but you're not far there in London from where Julian Assange is in jail. And why is he in in prison? The leading newspapers, including the New York Times, that ran his stories have said that he was a legitimate publisher and that they printed his material, and that it will ha- have a disastrous effect on free investment. They hardly ever mention that they've taken this position. But I want to tie it somehow to your experience. We, we uh, both as a director and as this, a person who defends uh, people who were uh, tortured or tries to get the facts out, how does the polite society that you folks otherwise live in respond to your tales uh, of basically a polite tyranny. <laughs> what happens at dinner party? How do you do? I mean, I think polite tyranny is a really is a good way of putting it. I, I've reflected on this a lot the last couple of months in the process of trying to release the film and also experiencing people's reactions to it. I think that the myths that we have about our society, about our politics, are incredibly powerful. Um, I mean, I I do think you know I'm I. I think fundamentally it's a story about power and I think power reinforces itself. And that is when I watch the film, that's what I see happening. I see these political processes that are then, um, you know, kind of um, sort of, I guess, just reinforcing themselves in a way that is, I guess that's not really answering your question about the plight society, but I, I, I think, I think we've, um, it's, I, th- I think a lot about what Gareth said as well. The capacity to be shocked is important. She says that in the film, Rabani's lawyer. And I think in many ways we have lost the capacity to be shocked. Um, so I, I don't, I don't well, know. They haven't lost it. They deliberately set out to prevent any accountability. I mean, that's the only way I could understand this. You know, this, uh, first of all, none of the claims that any of them, that that would justify it morally, but none of the claims that you had a ticking time bomb and you must do these things, none of them have, have been verified. And, and, and so this is not unimportant. I mean, for those who think there is a counter argument, they just haven't come up with it. President Obama couldn't come up with it. He came up with one example of one of the alleged supposed hijackers who didn't make it. It was in San Diego. And the guy was being bugged at every turn. And he was living at the home of an FBI informant. It was just utter nonsense. And, And so you don't even have the fire in the theater argument that usually informs these discussions. We've had decades now of dealing with it. And let's talk about the person that you were visiting before you you got your phone grabbed. Uh, What what do they have against this person? What did they come up with? So Ali al-Madri, the accusations against him, if you put it into context, his arrest happened um, in the immediate days after the 9-11 attacks. So in that time, during that period, there were a lot of um, men of Arab background that were being rounded up in, in the States. Um, so he, he had been already living in the United States. He was studying there. He, he attended, um, um, I think, college or university or, or something. He was studying there. So he was sort of one of those men who, who just rounded up um, and then taken through the entire you know, process of, of interrogation and criminalization. So the accusations varied depending on what year they were 
made to them to him. So he was accused of being connected to the 9-11 hijackers, which is all false. He was accused of creating a plot to bomb some university some way, if I remember correctly. Um, there were lots of accusations. All of them fell through because they were not based on evidence. It was just the idea that if we have this person and they are sufficiently uh, pressured, you know, and they're broken down, uh, basically tortured, then at some point they're going to make an admission. And using that admission, we will get a, a result. We've caught a terrorist and we can show that, you know, our war against terrorism is winning. So that was their idea. Now, in Ali al Marri's case, he's a very, um, I mean, he's an outstanding individual. He's a very uh, formidable, he's very resilient. Um, he didn't buckle, he didn't admit to anything um, until right at the end, as I mentioned earlier on, that he had to accept that plea deal. Um, so there, there was nothing. Basically, in answer to your question, there was nothing. Like, there was no plot. There was no accusation of being involved in any type of uh, you know action which was going to harm any Americans or any violence at, at, at all. All of those were just allegations, you know, that were made without okay, any basis. Okay, so then bringing it back, then, I mean, again, we're falling into the trap of thinking this is something not acceptable, but somehow. Just a, a screw up. I mean, this is a fact that you, uh, this is two governments, and, and they're part of a, a, a larger coalition, obviously. The five lies, uh, five powers, eyes, five eyes. I said five lies, five eyes. Five but peering. And they have, feel they have the right to grab any human being anywhere in the world, no matter their nationality or anything, and subject them to, at the very least, hold them for 12 years or whatever. Uh, without, you know, for a large part of that, anybody even knowing where they are. And then when you say sort of torture, what was done to him by this U.S. government, British government? Yeah. The, and Ali's case um, is covered in the documentary. I mean, some of the things that he had to go through, his family had to... Um, he was made to believe that his family were also um, captured and um, they made lots of insinuations and threats that, you know, if you don't comply, if you don't admit, we will do this to your wife, we'll do this to your children. He was made to believe at some points that they had already killed his some of his family members. So he was, it was a lot of it was psychological. But in, in, on, in addition to that, there was one um, major incident that's related into the, in the film where he was uh, physically strapped down, he was uh, beaten, and then he was he was not answering the questions that they were wanting him to answer. So they forcibly um, put a sock in his mouth uh, to the point of suffocation. Um, so there was physical abuse, there was psychological abuse, there was also sleep deprivation, which is a very powerful method of torture. Um, some of the clips from his cell actually featured in the documentary so um that show him you know just stuck in that small cell and to some extent of course it would affect someone's mental health and well-being so according to his lawyers um, they say that he reached points where he was uh, almost suicidal you know so he since then he's come out of that experience he's healed um i want to quickly just comment on one thing that kate mentioned about how power what the film does, I mean, Ali's story is a, is a very powerful um, emotional story of, of a human being and what, what happens when there's unrestricted arbitrary power. So if the state is granted more and more arbitrary power, it will inevitably abuse it and it takes its consent and legitimacy from us, the people, the, those who, you know, the state is meant to represent. What we've got here is a situation where the, the growth of that power is being accelerated because of technology. And that simply is how the state <coughs> uses surveillance, Use, accesses the technology at scale, uses that technology to gain more and more power in the relationship of state versus citizen. Where, to the point where instead of the state being accountable to citizens, you've got the you know um, opposite situation going on where the ordinary people, they don't have access to, you know, surveil or gain information 
about public officials, but public officials and institutions and bodies have amassed huge powers where they can collect information on everybody. And that's what Edward Snowden showed us. I mean, he actually revealed to the world how the American government, at least, is carrying out mass surveillance. Forget about targeted surveillance on suspects or those who may be involved in criminal activity. You're talking about once they got the powers, they've now deployed it against ordinary people en masse. So that's, I think, another feature of the film that it draws that out and explains that what type of society are we heading into where powerful entities, whether they're states or corporations, have got all of this power. Who's going to put a check on that? How do we make sure that they're actually restrained? What, what well, that was the whole it? point. I was gonna, maybe this would be a positive point on which to end this. Uh, uh, and, and I wish you luck pursuing this. And uh, not, when the film comes out, maybe we'll do this again. Uh, and when it's available, but people will go to the website and we'll post that. I, I found it. I, I got to watch your film. <laughs> so I hope we get to see it in theaters uh, soon. I found it really powerful for the very reason you just mentioned. You don't have to, you know, say you do end up beating people over there and slamming their head into the wall and doing all sorts of terrible, intimidating things. But the fact of the matter is it can all uh, be done on the quiet and, you know, drive people crazy, freak them out. And it's very interesting you bring up the technological aspect that we can get, so, because that was the issue here. Will they get your password? Period. Now, I'm amazed that they even needed your password. They probably have means to crack all these things anyway. They Maybe they mm -hmm. just were being overkill. But the point made, and I, Chief Justice Roberts, who a lot of my liberal friends don't like, and they don't like the you know Republican appointees. He wasn't a Trump appointee. They don't like any of them on the court. But they, they, he did speaking, for, you know, for for the court, uh, with full support of the court, said very clearly that technology does not trump the constitutional protection. Mm -hmm. And he says very clearly, the American Revolution. We all talk about patriotism and how wonderful we forget that we rebelled against the power that we considered at the time totalitarian in its total power. And he says, and he's not alone, it's been said over the years by constitutional scholars, that this Fourth Amendment protection against arbitrary intrusion by any policing power with their general writ of assistance or without a specific warrant is a fundamental, the fundamental denial of freedom, the fundamental. Mm -hmm. You know, if they can rummage about, mm -hmm. that's what they wanted to do. They wanted to rummage about in your cell phone. He specifically takes the cell phone, and mm -hmm. Justice Roberts says there's more information on that cell phone than was ever in anyone's domicile, and the American Revolution was fought over that principle more than any other. And now we have this uh, amazing thing, wow. somebody arrested in America, Live, trying to go to school in America, ends up talking to somebody who, after he's out, about his case and whether he's got a case. And in England, once again, they're doing the very thing that we were not supposed to be able to do. I think that's a good point on which to end. I wish you luck in getting this movie to a wider audience. Meanwhile, people should check out the trailer and uh, pursue the case. And you have a website, right, that you have a lot of yes. information. Do you want to tell us how we access it? Yes. Um, if you go to www.phantomparrot.com, you can uh, put your name into sign up for our mailing list, and we will let you know when the film becomes widely available to watch. And Phantom Parrot is this wonderful program uh, that Edward Snowden, uh, revealed. So Snowden, who I think by any reasonable standard should be considered a great hero, nonetheless, is, uh, was forced into exile in Russia. It wasn't his choice. They took away his papers. So, and again, uh, you got uh, Julian Assange sitting there uh, pretty close to where you folks are, mm. trying to tell us something about how power works. The whole point of the democratic experiment uh, even done by these uh, white men in wigs uh, that gave us our constitution was to hold power accountable. I applaud your efforts mm -hmm. as a filmmaker, as a civil liberties advocate uh, to hold power accountable. 
Uh, sadly enough, I say lots of luck, it seems like a rigged game. Uh, but that's it for this edition of Sheer Intelligence. I want to thank Laura Kondarajian and Christopher Ho at the at KCRW, the wonderful NPR station in Santa Monica, for posting the shows. Joshua Shear, our executive editor. Diego Ramos, who writes the intro. Max Jones, who does the video. And the JKW Foundation, in memory of a fiercely independent writer, Gene Stein, for helping to fund these shows. See you next week with another edition of Sheer Intelligence. Thank <laughs> you.